Hi there. So I'm going to talk a bit about German influence over the European Union. And when it comes to the European Union, it's really Germany who's steering the ship. They're the ones determining the direction, um, and more specifically, the, the policy making and decision making within the European Union, and especially within the Eurozone. Now, this video is not supposed to be an attack on Germans as a people. I've met Germans before, and honestly, I can't say a bad word about them. But I, do ha I can't help but think that a lot of their societal attitudes stem from German guilt. The idea that they have to compensate for what happened in the past. Um, and I'm going to link to a video called the, Ger the Consequences of German Guilt done by a German YouTuber called Crichton T. It was posted on Zargon of Akkad's channel. There's actually a possibility you've saw it before, but I'll link it anyway. It's, it's a good video to understand where what, what German attitudes are like really in regards to, to this whole idea of German guilt. Now, of course, Germany is quite a successful country. It, it's... Um, really weathered the financial crisis pretty well and in fact it actually acted as a creditor in many cases during the financial crash but this um, actually gave it a significant amount of influence when it came to how the money was being used and, and things like this. I'll talk about that in a bit but um, the problem is that Germany tends to take a one shoe size fits all approach and the problem with this is um, that one shoe size doesn't fit all and there's a lot of talk um, even of dividing up the single currency into multiple currencies. To, um, the AFD, for example, are talking about breaking it into a northern euro and a southern euro. And there's been some talk of a flexible euro, which would essentially be a nationalized euro in every country where you would have a Greek euro and a German euro and a, a French euro, so on and so forth. And the German politicians would try to justify this by using the, the phrase Tina um, and Tina stands for there is no alternative. And, and this, this is something that you would expect of an authoritarian. Um, but before anyone points out, because I know, I know that some people are probably going to say this, so I'll, I'll try to jump ahead. Critics might say that, that, you know, on paper, really Germany can't have any power because it, it, the, the, the way the um, legislator and executive are set up, it, it's supposed to be equal or equal-ish among all the countries. Um, for example, the first legislative body, the EU Council, has 28 seats, one seat for each member state. The executive, the EU Commission, is the same. It is 28 seats, one seat for each member state. Um, the second legislator, the EU Parliament, has 751 seats. and They're allocated not by GDP, but by population size and digression. Uh, that meaning that there's there's more people represented by one politician for these larger states like Germany. Germany, for example, has 96 seats, which is 12.8% of parliament, but it's got 16% of the EU population. And personally, I don't like that sort of system. If, German, if you're going to create that legislative body by representation of population, Germany should have 16% within the EU parliament like it should have as the population size. And one of the reasons I say that is because um, with with a smaller amount of politicians, there's less representation of differing views. Um, so you, you ba basically you can end up with like concentrated Europhilia, you know what I mean? It, it, say, say for example that they, they had 99 seats, which they previously did. Those three politicians could be Eurosceptics. But because you, you've concentrated it down to 96 seats, you might not be getting the full range of distant views there. Um, but rarely are politics that straightforward. We all know that. And a country the size of Germany, having such a large economy and being a creditor to many of the, the um, countries that struggled during the financial crisis, th they have influence in other ways too. For example, Germany contributed 24 billion euros in 2015. The overall EU budget for 2015 was 160 billion euros. That was almost a seventh of the budget coming from Germany. Take for example Hungary. 5.6 billion euros was spent for development in Hungary in 2015. Imagine the kind of power that Germany wields over a country like Hungary. T taking away Germans' contributions would, would absolutely eliminate any, any development within Hungary. It would destroy so many countries. And, and that sort of, that power that they have over other countries, that cannot be underestimated. And that's one of the reasons why Angela Merkel felt so empowered to threaten the Visegrad. Now the Visegrad or the V4 is Czech Republic 
Poland, Hungary and Slovakia. And last year they said that they were going to ignore these migrant quotas and start tightening their borders. Um, I've done a video there recently um, about Poland refusing these migrant quotas and being threatened with sanctions from the EU and Hungary's in the same position too. But not only has Angela Merkel been responsible for these open borders policies, she's also been responsible for saying no access to the single market without uh, accepting free movement. That, that was directed at Britain for Brexit, of course. And that's just her way of making it clear to everyone that she makes the rules regarding um, the migrant crisis. She's also been quoted as saying, It's not acceptable that we have free movement of goods and people, um, that some countries say this we can't do and that we can't, and we can't take in Syrians because we aren't ready. She's carried on as saying, um, When someone says this is not my Europe, I won't accept Muslims, I have to say this is not negotiable. Again, there's that no alternative sort of idea coming in. I'm the one who makes the rules, you do what I say. And of course, she, she knows that with, with um budgetary contributions like like um their pen in, in 2015 she has a lot of control there on the idea of germany being a massive creditor to um countries that suffered during the financial crisis there's an article from financial times um germany is the eurozone's biggest problem and in it it talks about how germany um when it lends money that it's, it's more worried about how the money is used rather than the terms of repayment and so on and so forth i mean think think of greece um, and it's multiple austerity programs and they really didn't want that to the point where there's actually riots in the streets um, but th this all stems from the Germans view on macroeconomics which is believed to have stemmed from Walter Aachen and his approach entails number one a balanced budget at all times number two price stability and three price flexibility and this this German idea then is pushed onto other countries like Greece but German philosophies and economics have also been pushed on the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank focuses primarily on controlling inflation. Unlike the US Federal Reserve, it doesn't really account for employment, growth and stability. And surprise, surprise, those are massive problems within the Eurozone at the minute. But it, it, the, the, the European Central Bank on its own website states that it, it uh, prioritises controlling inflation. Anything under 2% is considered stable and it is barely managing to control that. In February it reached 2% inflation. Um, it was, it's been confirmed at 1.9% inflation in April and according to Trade and Economics it's forecast to reach 2.03% in June. Now something to understand about the Eurozone is that for a single currency to work among such diverse countries they need to establish a series of similarities and a set of common goals. This is very very difficult to achieve within the Eurozone with, with the um, range of diversity and economic needs. And despite the claim that diversity is a strength it's actually a, a hindrance. It makes it very very hard to establish common fiscal policy. As Joseph Stiglitz points out in his book, The Euro, How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe, Germany decided what those similarities and goals should be. Namely, fiscal prudence, low deficit and low debts. That might work for Germany, but it doesn't necessarily work for all of Europe. Take, for example, Ireland pre-crisis. It had a trade surplus. Its government spending to GDP was relatively low and its debt to GDP was also low. Spain was in a similar position. According to the German philosophy, this really should have meant that they would have been okay during the financial crisis, but they weren't. Ireland had to be bailed out with 64 billion euros, and Spain had to be bailed out with 100 billion euros. Now, another problem with the Eurozone is that in times of crisis, normally what countries would do if they're suffering from low demand, for example, is that they'd lower their exchange rates in order to make their exports more competitive. The problem with the Eurozone is that poorer countries can't do this because the exchange rates are um, governed by the European Central Bank. Um, so the, the only other way of making yourself competitive in that sense would be either one by lowering the prices of the products which would then squeeze profit margins and start discouraging um, investors or two you would um, have to lower your wages and the way you go about lowering your wages is to bring over hundreds and thousands of highly skilled highly educated Syrian doctors What's up? Money, money, money. Joseph Stiglitz points out 
the idea of lowering wages came from Germany. I mean, they were doing this even before the financial crisis. And as I said earlier, Germany acting as a creditor to countries like Greece was actually more concerned about how the money was being used than they were about repayment. And this led to Germany basically um, telling Greece that they had to cut their minimum wages during its austerity programs. And that, of course, turned out to be so unpopular that there was actually riots as a result. One of the solutions could have been for Germany to actually increase its prices and wages. That would have lowered the value of the euro to aid the struggling countries. But Germany didn't want to accept any of the burden, even though it's calling for a more integrated European Union. It's kind of an interesting theme, actually. Recently, when Macron met with Merkel, he asked her about a common eurozone investment bond. Merkel didn't want to criticise him, so she just evaded the question altogether. This is because Germans fear that a common eurozone investment bond might involve Germany sharing some of the debts with its poorer countries. Merkel made it very clear during the financial crisis that the EU was not a transfer union. In other words, there would be no sharing of resources between countries because Germany would be the one likely transferring most of its resources out of the country. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit arrogant, honestly, that Germany would criticise Britain for choosing its self-interest with Brexit. And then here's Germany choosing self-interest all the time. It wants all the benefits out of the European Union, but it doesn't want to share the debt with the poorer countries. Yet it expects them and them alone to take the burden, even though it's making decisions for those countries. A little bit hypocritical, honestly, Merkel. But it's not just the economy that the Germans seem to be um, controlling, it's the internet as well. Like I said earlier, the Germans feel um, guilty for what happened in the past and that they need to compensate for this. And so they've become immensely politically correct. And this comes in, in the form of, of censoring things on the internet and so on and so forth. You might remember the YouTube Heroes video that came up. And people really, really despised it. They were talking about, um, you know, like flagging wars and, and mass flagging of videos. And, you know, that it would be used to silence anyone who, who had um, different opinions. And it was, it was immensely unpopular. Well, there was a German version. And as Crichton T points out in his video, um, it was completely praised by YouTubers, the media and politicians alike. Un unlike here where it was, was condemned as it should be. It was praised over there. I recommend watching his video because it gives a wee bit more insight into the German censorship of what they call hate speech, which is an incredibly vague term and purposely so. And who is who is responsible for pushing these bills? Um, I, don't, I don't want to bring it all up here because I just end up repeating what he said in his video, but I recommend watching it. Germany has also decided that Twitch is now a radio service and as such, streaming on it requires a broadcasting license. This license can cost between 1,000 to 10,000 euros depending on the audience size. This means the content creators must follow a set of government regulations when they're posting online or they could face fines or other penalties. The potential consequences of something like that is unthinkable, especially if it reached YouTube or if it's spread outside of Germany, which is possible. Within the EU, a new bill has been proposed called the Audiovisual Reform, which could potentially lead to a nanny state situation. The idea was spearheaded by two German politicians, Sabine Ferrien, um, who's a member of Merkel's CDU party and the European People Party, and Petra Kammervert, who studied sociology and political science at the University of Duisburg, and is a member of Martin Schulz's Social Democrat Party and is part of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats Parliamentary Group. These are two people with clear leftist bias. The regulation seeks to destroy the competitive edge that the internet has over television and it puts regulations on video sharing platforms including YouTube. That basically controls the content that can be posted and even suggests a ban on product placement so people can't even get sponsored videos. Unfortunately, this seems to have reached the UK as Theresa May has plans to regulate the online world as much as the offline world. A bad piece of legislation, a bad right to be walking down. Within Germany, um, Merkel has also threatened that companies like Facebook could face fines of up to 50 million euros for failing to remove so-called hate speech within a timely manner. As Crichton T points out in another one of his videos, back in July of 2016, German authorities raided the homes of 60 people for supposed online hate speech. Many of them got fines and the German Minister of Justice Heiko Maas said that those people can expect to be fired for their online comments. 
He also pointed out that um, German users who were posting anything Nazi related uh, got fined or imprisoned, yet the migrants who were performing Nazi salutes, they get off scot-free. A German couple who were arrested during the raids were sentenced for um, a private Facebook group that was criticising migrants. The group talked about the rise in crime brought about by the influx of migrants. There was nothing Nazi related or even nationalistic within the group. The judge, however, felt the group was hostile in his infamous ruling. So now the, the sentences are being carried out by how a judge feels about it. That is, that is horrendous. The description of the group is a series of generalizations with a clear right wing background, he said. So, so what are you trying to say? Is, is being right wing a crime now? Jesus Christ. Peter M. was given a nine-month suspended prison sentence and his wife was given a fine of 1,200 euros. There does seem to be a bit of resistance to this, thankfully. This week, a group called the Identitarians were protesting outside the German Ministry of <coughs> Supposed Justice after Heiko Maas proposed another hate speech law. They said that this was a prohibition of opinion and they basically stood outside with, with flares and banners um, protesting the proposed piece of legislation. Uh, the Identitarians, they, they're like sort of a youth group all across Europe and, and they do various um, protests like this. They, they've climbed on top of um, p political buildings and landmarks and so on and so forth and they, they hang these banners out that, that criticise mass immigration. They're, they're essentially um, a conservative group that want to keep Europe as it is and, and they're opposed to mass immigration. I expect that we're going to be hearing a lot more from this group in the future. Um, I think this is something that Germans really need. They need to get some self-respect back. I, th I think that's really, really important for them. But anyway, that's my video. Um, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. And thanks for watching. Money, money, money.